a philosopher is somebody who actually lives their lives in a certain way. You know, mm -hmm. the reason we admire Socrates is not because he was good at theory, although he was. He, he was doing interesting philosophy, but because he literally mm -hmm. lived his philosophy. Welcome to the podcast, Massimo Pigliucci. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of your work. I've been following you for Thank quite you. a while now, and it was a great honor to read The Quest for Character, which I demolished this week very quickly. Um, and it was brilliant. Like it really, it's hitting on something that just had been going around in my mind for, that just seems really topical. So I wanted to ask you, why this book? Why now? I, I'm really curious, like at this time. Yeah, good question. You know, the, the original idea for the book was actually to write the entire book about the story of Socrates and Alcibiades, which still mm -hmm. is a good chunk of, of what is there now. Uh, it later expanded into a broader treatment of the relationship between ethics and politics uh, and, and the, yeah. the role played by character in that relationship. But it started out really because I've always been fascinated by obviously by Socrates, you know, being a philosopher, you cannot avoid being fascinated by Socrates. <laughs> um, but but also by Alcibiades. I mean, I am I am honestly mm -hmm. baffled that nobody has done a movie yet on the life of Alcibiades yeah. because you know here we have this guy who was impossibly handsome, rich. Mm -hmm full of himself, you know, ambitious, yeah. uh, brilliant. Uh, he was a really smart guy. And yet he, he was catastrophic. And, you know, his behavior was mm. a catastrophe both for himself. He eventually ended up being killed by Spartan spies, probably, uh, and for, yeah. for Athens. I mean, one, one can argue that, that uh, he was pretty much one of the major factors why Athens lost the Peloponnesian War against uh, Sparta. So, so the relationship between yeah. you know one of the greatest philosophers of all time and one of the greatest scandals of all time <laughs> is kind of interesting, particularly because they were friends. They were mm -hmm. uh, they were also they also had a, a relationship of student and and uh, and mentor. And r the rumor goes they were also lovers, or at least Alcibiades mm. wanted to be very much Socrates. Yeah, and lover, he got so. rebuked by Socrates. Or I, I remember in one of the dialogues that he's saying, you know, I couldn't even seduce Socrates. He's this kind of pillar of virtue. You know, I couldn't get away with it. But <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And look, look at so this is the guy that is that is so handsome that every woman or man just falls for him, no matter mm. what. And then he's trying to seduce Socrates, who is notoriously ugly. Um, and several <laughs> years, you know, 20 years, he's, he's elder. And he's like, nope, Socrates is just not interested. It's not working out. <laughs> mm. It's fascinating. Nope. Man. And to have a mentor like Socrates, you'd think, you know, he could do something to help him. You know, I, I'm kind of thinking of like Heraclitus, you know, character as fate. And three, how was it? Eth ethos, anthropos, yeah. Damon. Um, that, is there this... Is that something that you discovered more as you delved into the story? Did it make you more hopeful for teaching virtue or did it make you more skeptical? <laughs> uh, I, I guess neither. It, it really, I started <laughs> out pretty hopeful. Then I became a little bit more skeptical. And then I kind of went back to some degree, yeah. moderate degree okay. of, of hope. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I, I don't think Socrates necessarily failed with Alcibiades. So maybe we should tell a little bit of the background of the story. Yeah, at, certainly. At this yeah. point. So mm -hmm. the book starts out, you know, second chapter in the book is about uh, this early relationship between Alcibiades and Socrates. Alcibiades in his 20s, very ambitious. He wants to be a leader in Athens. Uh, but he knows enough that he goes to Socrates and says, you know, what can I do here? What, what, what do I need to do in order to be successful? And Socrates initially uh, acts as a mentor. He says, OK, let's take a look here. Basically, what follows is a job interview of sorts where Socrates asks Alcibiades questions about, you know, what are your goals? What do you want to do? How do you think you're going to go about it? That sort of stuff. But by the end of the dialogue, this is in the Alcibiades Major, which is a dialogue that is often attributed to Plato, though we don't actually know for sure that, it, that Plato wrote it. But at the end, by the end of the dialogue, Socrates says, I'm sorry, Alcibiades, you really shouldn't do this thing. You don't, you know, stay away from politics because you're going to be a disaster um, because your, your priorities are exactly the wrong ones. You're basically you're into self-aggrandizing. You don't you don't really care about the city and the welfare of the people. You just care about your glory, 
And so you, and in fact, and Socrates goes so far as saying, you and many like you, meaning many politicians, really shouldn't be into that that game because mm-hmm. it's going to be it's going to be a disaster. And it turns out Socrates was right. In fact, you know, Alcibiades ignores Socrates' advice, goes into politics, and it's one disaster after another. So, in a sense, this is not really a failure on the part of Socrates. Socrates just realized mm-hmm. that it was impossible to teach virtue to uh, Alcibiades. So now the question mm-hmm. then is, well, but can we teach virtue at all? all right, so is it, mm-hmm. is it that Socrates determined that Alcibiades in particular couldn't learn, or is it that just that virtue is not the kind of thing that can be taught? And that's where things get a little more interesting and a little more complicated, mm-hmm. right? The first chapter of the book is about this particular question, and Socrates there changes his mind. In one of the Platonic dialogues, uh, the Meno, he uh, arrives at the conclusion that, no, virtue cannot be taught. And his reasoning is, look, if virtue were the kind of things that can't, that could be taught, then we would see a lot of teachers out there. You know, th- this would be a good thing to teach. There would be a lot of mm. people that specialize in teaching virtue. But, yeah, I, but Socrates says, I don't see anybody that does that sort of stuff. I don't, at least not anybody successful. Sure, the sophists claim that they do that, but it's like, no, nah, they're not. They're not. They're just fooling people. So his conclusion tentatively is that virtue, unfortunately, whatever virtue is, it cannot be taught. But then in uh, another Platonic dialogue, the Protagoras, Socrates arrives, changes his mind. He arrives at the exactly opposite conclusion. And interestingly, and the fascinating thing is that Socrates changes his mind by talking to a sophist, right? So the sophists are the arch enemies of, of Socrates in a sense, yes. right? They're, they're really, they're these people who basically they are the, the, the forerunner of modern lawyers. They, they can teach people to ha- argue one way or the opposite of one way and equally well, right? So as if there was no truth of the matter about, about things. Yep. In fact, still today, the word sophist is kind of an insult, right? If you say to somebody that is a sophist, you're telling him that he's bullshitting you. And, yep. But the fact of the matter is that the ancient sophists were, in fact, in fact, teachers, itinerant teachers, and they were teachers of rhetoric, what we would today call rhetoric. So they were teaching people how to uh, defend themselves in a court of law, for instance, which was an important thing, an important skill to, to learn. Now, Protagoras, in the dialogue, in the Platonic dialogue, argues with Socrates and says, now, look, yes, of course, virtue can be taught. And in fact, it's very important to teach virtue. Protagoras uses an analogy, says that um, virtue is like music. Everybody can learn to play an instrument, and you learn the better if you have a good teacher. Now, of course, not everybody becomes Mozart, right? Not everybody gets to Carnegie Hall, but everybody can improve, can learn better you know, how to, how to play uh, music because it is a skill. It is what the, the Greeks call the techne. Technique is a technique, right? Now, how do you learn technique? In part, you learn the theory, right? Learning a little bit of musical theory is, a, is helpful if you want to learn an instrument. But mostly, you're going to practice. And you're going to practice over and over and over. And especially, you're going to practice under the supervision of a good musician so that mm. the musician can correct you wherever, wherever you're going to wrong. Most of the practice is going to be on your own, right? You're going to do it on your own at home. But uh, from time to time, you want the direction of a musician who is going to teach you the right form and so on and so forth. And Protagoras says the same exact thing goes for virtue. Some of us are naturally more virtuous than others, uh, just like some of us have a natural talent for music and others don't. But everybody can mm-hmm. learn to be more virtuous, you know, better to be a better person. And, of course, the way to do that is to practice a lot, basically every moment of your life, and at least from time to time to go to a teacher, to somebody who actually does behave well, who is a good person, and can teach you how to do it. Um, and Sardis, by the end, surprisingly says, I guess you're right. That's, that's true. Mm. T- t- virtue can be taught. Yeah, it's interesting. And also, I mean, because this is Socrates in Plato in his dialogues. And I almost get the feeling reading Plato um, that there's a sort of spiritual exercise going on with the whole thing that there's through the dialogues, you know, he's trying to exemplify virtue, even if they're not getting the right answers. Um, Do you think that that's kind of a way of teaching virtue 
through these examples. Yes, I yes, I agree. I think that when Plato mm -hmm. and Plato wasn't the only one, but Plato was particularly skilled at this. You know, when mm -hmm. Plato writes a dialogue or when when another friend of Socrates, Xenophon, writes dialogues yeah. that feature mm -hmm. usually Socrates as a character, uh, the the level of sort of communication is twofold. On the one hand, they're really telling you something about Socrates and and, uh, and his philosophy, but at the same level, they are also exemplifying how do you, do, how do you teach uh, these kind of yep. things through, for instance, mm -hmm. through dialogues with somebody who is already advanced, who already knows uh, uh, a lot about whatever the topic at hand happens to be, including virtue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And why do you think we've we're not really good at it now? Two thousand years later, like you would surely, if it was kind of a reproducible <laughs> skill, we would have uh, mapped it out. We'd have you know there'd be apps you could go on and get your character together. Um, it seems like we're just in the same well, predicament as always. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you're right. But you know, mm -hmm. again, the analogy with other techniques is pretty good. I mean, how many good musicians do you know? Or how many good really sculptors good. or painters do you know, right? Not not that many. Uh, so yeah. and it's not like we don't know how to do it. We do, uh, but few people bother. Mm. And so the question here is, I think the, the answer, I think, is very similar. That is, unfortunately, few people bother to try to learn to be a better person. They, mm. Most of us think that we are good people. In fact, one of yeah. the scientists that I mentioned in the in the book and in the, in the next to the last mm. chapter in the book is Christian Miller, who wrote a book. He's a mm. social scientist who wrote a book called The Character Gap. And the, the gap refers to the disparity between how good we think we are and how good we actually are, right? When, when, when people <laughs> measure our behavior, there is a gap there, right? There is, it's like we're not oh, as yeah. good as we think we are. And so it's like um, everybody thinks that they are very good drivers, you know, better than average drivers. And that, that can't be the case, right? Not, not everybody can be <laughs> yeah. a bad, above average, kind of by definition. Half, half has to be worse. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really um, that kind of, and that seems to be for me very much what this kind of philosophical type of philosophy as a way of life kind of digs into is the need for that reflection on your actual state of affairs, honestly, or how you're actually, you know, ethically where Correct. are you at and how are you you know what is your character actually like i'm thinking of epictetus like you can only learn something by first recognizing that you don't know it or that you have to get over your knowledge to actually start learning so <laughs> do people have to kind of pay attention to their vices more to learn virtue would that be a kind of you know well, that's certainly one point? way to do it i mean mm. yeah that's certainly one way to do it miller uh actually discusses what works and what doesn't mm. work in order to improve to close okay. the character gap right to yeah. so what kind of, of empirical evidence we have and interestingly his suggestions are pretty much the same that the ancient greco romans would would mm. advance i mean uh, i think that if um, epictetus or seneca were to read uh, uh, the character gap today they would say well yeah of course i told you so so yeah. <laughs> one thing that works, for instance, is, uh, as you just said, pay attention. Uh, so critical analysis of your own behavior, right? It turns out that, you know, we often say that, oh, you get, you get older and you get wiser. That's not true. Uh, mm. You don't just get wiser by getting older. You get wiser by getting older and by pay attention to what happens to you, right? To actually mm. pay attention analytical critical attention to what happens so you if you are willing to learn from your experiences then you become wiser otherwise you just mm -hmm. become older uh you know yeah. so so it's a necessary condition for becoming wiser to have experience you know a wise 15 year old for instance it's pretty much an oxymoron it just there's no such a thing not because yeah. of his fault you know the person can be mm. a very nice you know very very good person but it doesn't have enough life experience to really be wise but if mm. you get to your 50s or 60s or whatever it is mm. uh, you are wise not just because you got there but because you got there and you learned from your experiences right and that's exactly what epictetus would say or what socrates would say i mean when um, uh, socrates tells us that he follows the injunction of the of the oracle at delphi know thyself mm. 
right? Yep. What, is that, what does he mean by that? Well, that's exactly what he means. Learn mm. yourself, meaning learn from your experiences. Think critically about what happens to you and what you do. So that way you're going to improve. You're going to get better. Yeah, there's a really interesting kind of value or prioritization there as well. That's like, I, I think in our culture, obviously, it's so complicated and the technology doesn't really help. But the emphasis in stoicism on character and on wisdom and on virtue seem to be preconditions to actually advancing in them. Like if you grow up in an environment where nobody talks about that and there's no examples of it or role models or emphasis, um, you're kind of stuck. So I wonder, with is there yep. in the modern education system? Do you think there's more room for this um, type of curriculum? I know, I know at the end of the book we're probably skipping ahead, but um, it seems like there's a gap in the market there um, that's only filled by these types. There of definitely is a gap. Your work, mm. right? Right. There is a there is a gap there, and I don't. Unfortunately, I think that it's not going to be filled anytime soon. We mm. again, we know how to do these things. There is there is yeah. both philo a philosophy, of course, of you know, moral philosophy and ethical ethical philosophy. There is also a, a social science of how to do these things. We we do mm. have some ideas, at least, how to teach people to be better and uh, you know more virtues and you know develop a better character. But we don't mm. do it by and large, for mm. the same reason I think that um, we don't teach a lot. Uh, you know, to people do how to drive or how to play an instrument because every either people mm. don't care, like in the case of musical instruments, or people think that yep. they already know how to do it, as in the case of driving yep. or parenting. I mean, you know, when was the last time you saw somebody taking parenting classes? And I don't mean birth parenting classes. lessons. I mean classes <laughs> on how to be a parent, right? Yeah. You didn't yep. do that because why not? Well, because of course we of course you know how to be a parent. Mm. The, the data say otherwise. You know, any any good yeah. social psychologist will tell you that most people actually have no idea how to be good parents. They have to reinvent <laughs> the wheel from scratch every every time, right? Well, why? Mm. We we could be teaching that sort of stuff. It's not like we don't know yeah. anything about it. But people mm. don't bother because they think they 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 know. So equally, people don't bother trying to learn how to become you know, good human beings because everybody thinks of themselves as a good human being. And yeah. unfortunately, mm. there is a gap. Yeah, it's interesting. It reminds me of kind of Socrates saying that everybody is following their own good. Like even the person that kills somebody will have a story about why it was a good thing that they did. Right. Um, so like, I guess it, it comes down to, I've gotten to this place before in a few podcasts talking about philosophy where it's like, how do you encourage people to engage in philosophy? I mean, we kind of assume that if somebody's interested in it, you know, it's it's like Alcibiades, I suppose. How do you take somebody that's not following the path and get them on it? Or are we just appealing to the people that are already into it, that are already, you know, improving themselves and want more philosophy? Yeah. For it? Is there a separation? There? Right. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. I think we can do both, but at different levels. So. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons Alci Alci Socrates failed with Alcibiades, although, as I said before, I don't think it was actually a failure as much as a recognition yeah. that Alcibiades was just not good material uh, mm -hmm. for, for it. Mm. But one of the reasons Alci Socrates allegedly failed is because it was too late. Alcibiades had already grown up in an mm. environment that uh, put a premium on glory and, you know, and, and, uh, fame and money and stuff like that and not mm. on virtue and so it was already too late by the time he's he's in his 20s uh you know he's gone we have evidence from moral developmental psychology today mm. that people's character form in the very early years and by the time you get to be a teenager late mm. late teenage or early 20s it's done and your character is pretty much formed yeah, you can work on it and smooth over certain things, uh, especially if you have sort of an internal motivation. You can certainly improve, but uh, it's not like somebody's going to come out from the outside at you know at age twenty, twenty-two, or something like that, and, and completely shape your character. It's just not possible. So, mm -hmm. in a sense, one therefore one answer is we should be teaching moral philosophy, ethics, much earlier than we do now yeah it should be and done I, at the level of uh, certainly mm. middle school and possibly elementary school that's yeah. right so um, interesting because i'm i'm doing a phd in ethics at the moment and it's obviously in academic ethics and something you talk about in the book is the split between the academic version of ethics and then what we're talking about which is more of 
um, how you live your life. Um, Because there seems to be a real divide there um, just in terms of the actual subject of ethics as it's taught and how it would need to be done for it to be a practice for people. There is a big big divide. For one thing, the modern meaning of the word ethics is, you know, if you if you take a, a course in moral philosophy, uh, for instance, at university, pretty much what you get taught, uh, with few exceptions, is that ethics has to do with the study of right and wrong. So that, that ethics is concerned with, is this action right or is this action wrong? But for the Greco-Romans, ethics literally was the study of how to live your life. That's much broader than just, yep. you know, concerned with, with right and wrong. Of course, yep. part of living a good life is also the ability to decide whether an action is right or wrong, whether, whether you want to do it or not. But that's only a part of it. There is also issues of your priorities, your values, you know, what you want to do, what kind of person you want to be, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So we should be teaching ethics in that sense. And we, by and large, we don't. With, with a few exceptions, we don't. The other thing mm-hmm. about modern moral philosophers is that there is these uh, series of studies that came out a number of years ago that actually show that professors of moral philosophy are not more ethical than the average academic. And if you think well about it, it yeah. right, so the, people have done the experiment, and people have actually done this, this is data-based, right? Yeah. Um, so if you think about it, that means that there is, there is a major disconnect between mm. teaching moral philosophy and practicing moral philosophy, right? So mm. the people that teach moral philosophy are interested in the, in the subtleties about the differences between Kant and, and John Stuart Mill or different uh, types of utilitarianism and stuff like that. So they go on and on and on in terms of mm. their the theory, but then they go home and they don't actually practice any of the stuff that they, that they taught to their students. And so one would want to, to ask, then what the hell is the point? Right? Yeah. That would be like, say, somebody teaching a course in finance and then you discover that he's bankrupt. It's like, wait, well, that's, why are you it's teaching happening finance? on the internet quite a lot. <laughs> There's probably yes, plenty. Yes, it is. Of... That's right. <laughs> There's plenty, plenty of examples like, like that. But it's like, but mm. then you start questioning, right? So wait a minute. Why, why are you teaching me this, this sort of stuff? Or yeah, yeah. a psychologist who tries to tell me how to manage my, uh, my relationship, let's say, and then I found out that he's you know, thrice divorced. It's like, wait a minute, yeah. how, how did you manage mm-hmm. you know, not to learn from, from yourself? Why are you teaching me? In the ancient, yeah. you know, in, in, in ancient Greco-Roman tradition, but not only, even in um, Eastern traditions, Mesoamerican traditions and African traditions, a philosopher is somebody who actually lives their lives in a certain way. You know, the reason we admire Socrates is not because he was good at theory, although he was. He, he was doing interesting philosophy, but because he literally mm-hmm. lived his philosophy. He wasn't just going around telling people, hey, you know, you should know yourself and then, and then ignore his own advice. He was the first mm-hmm. one to put in practice what he was saying. Practice what you preach. Um, yeah, it's really, it reminds yes, me, I do exactly. a lot of... A lot of martial arts as well and the way i've started kind of thinking about so i actually spoke to donald robertson about it as well he thought it was interesting that uh it it's like in martial arts like if you had kind of guy that does loads of them but is you know isn't fit and can't do the techniques and isn't able to actually do it like they have the knowledge but they're they're not doing it regularly so you're it's almost like a kind of ethical fitness or a kind of ethical practice that you're engaging in exactly. and what if somebody's interested in it and they want to prioritize this more they're thinking, okay, I could be a better person. How how should they start? What are the the practices that they need to work on um, to start ethical well, self? Well, for that, yeah. So the 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 lucky the good the good part of the story is that there are a lot of resources these days. If you, if mm. you are into ethical self improvement, and you know some people really generally are, then there are a lot of resources. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, the kind of conversation you and I are having, you know, in a podcast mm-hmm. is t- certainly one resource. There's lots of books out there, of course, about ethical self-improvement. Some of them are not that good. Some of them mm-hmm. are. So you need to be careful what, you know, what, what you take uh, as, uh, as your guide. Uh, you can join groups of people who are interested in ethical self-improvement. There are a lot of uh, 
stoic groups, for instance, in around the world. If anybody's interested in joining one, they can go to the Stoic Fellowship uh, and register there. And this is basically a database of stoic groups throughout the world so that uh, if yep. there is one in, in, in near your area, you can join them and, and practice together because one of the things that the Greco romans argued is that you become a better person in part by hanging around people who are trying themselves to become better better individuals, better human beings. Uh, they also, I mean, you mentioned practices. There are also practical exercises. Most of those exercises come from Stoicism, from the Stoic tradition, but not all. Uh, and, uh, and there are books out there that actually go into the exercises. I wrote one of these books a few years ago with my friend Greg Lopez. It's called The Handbook for New Stoics, and it contains actually a whopping 52 exercises. You can do it one a week for an entire year, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all derived from the Greco-Roman tradition. So they're all based on Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus, Musonius Rufus. Pierre Hadot, a French scholar, a number of years ago, back in the 90s, wrote a book called um, Philosophy as a Way of Life. And in there, there is a good chapter on uh, so-called spiritual exercises or, or philosophical mm -hmm. exercises. So there are exercises that one can do. Uh, one of the most important ones is the philosophical diary. Uh, the idea is that pretty much every day, or at least most days, before you go to bed, before you retire at the end of the, of the day, you should take a few minutes, open up your laptop or, or, or your physical diary, however you want to do it, and write down your reflections, your critical reflections about what you did during the day. I don't mean just a list of things, you know, I've done this, I've done that, that sort of stuff, uh, like in a, in, a, in a diary, but an actual philosophical journal where you ask yourself, so I did this, what, what did I do right, what did I do wrong, and what could I have done better? Those three questions, which are, is the way Seneca frames this exercise, are very important because you want to learn about what you did wrong, not so that you can, you know, beat yourself on the on the on the back and all that sort of stuff, because that's that's useless. You regret this; it's it's a waste of time. But so that you learn from your own experiences, right? So you put it black on white. Say, okay, well, today I didn't react very well to this particular situation, right? Yeah, I got uh, angry at a colleague, for instance, and I shouldn't have. Okay, noted, right? Mm -hmm. Then you also ask yourself, what is what did you did to do that was right? That what did you get right? Now, for instance, you could say, oh, but at the same time, I was pretty generous with my time. I helped this other colleague, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's a good thing to do. That, that's that's some, one that goes into the positive sort of column. And then the third question is, what could I have done better? And the reason to ask yourself that question is because uh, many of our situations, life situations, actually repeat themselves over and over and over. Uh, you know, we, mm -hmm. sometimes we, we, we talk like uh, our lives were endlessly fascinating and all sorts of new, new things were happening. But in reality, most people's lives are you know, pretty predictable. You get up in the morning, you go to work, you see the same people, you come back at home, you, you, you see your partner or your children. Uh, during the weekend, you go out with your friends. It's, you're doing pretty much the same thing with the same people over and over and over, which means that certain situations will repeat themselves. So if today you got angry, let's say, at a colleague because he put, uh, you know, he left the computer on where or when it should have been off or something like that, well, you can be sure that that's going to happen again. Now, if you make yourself a mental note and say, okay, this time, I reacted with anger. Next time, I'm going to try to do it differently. I'm going to try to talk to him, you know, in a more calm way. I'm going to try to remind myself that, you know, people do things. And after all, there's not much of a difference whether the computer is on and off. Who cares? Mm -hmm. That sort of stuff. Then next time, you are mentally prepared to react better to that situation. And the more you do that... The more you prepare yourself mentally on the basis of your experiences, the, the better person you become because uh, mm. it is a question of habit. It's a question of mindful habit, right? The, way you be, the fundamental way in which you become a better person is the same way in which you become a better anything, 
right? If you want to become a better athlete or a better musician or a better writer, what do you do? You go a lot to the gym or you practice a lot, a lot with your instrument or you write a lot, right? It's you, you make it a habit. And once you make it a habit, then little by little it percolates and, and eventually it solidifies. That's it. Yeah, exactly. And would you say character is in some sense your pattern that you're following? It's almost like a pattern of behavior that you're the kind of the constraints that are regulating the, your pattern of behavior through life and that by changing it, you can change outcomes. It's, it's kind of like if you were not addressing your, this particular pattern or your habits, you're just kind of drifting along towards an undefined endpoint. but by actually actively engaging with it, you're guiding yourself towards where you want to go. That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, a character mm. is, in fact, a pattern of behavior, predictable, consistent yeah. pattern of behavior. So when you say that your friend is generous, for instance, what you mean is that generally speaking, not, maybe not all the time, but generally speaking, is willing to give money or time or, or help uh, to other people, right? That's what it means to be generous. And that's a yeah. positive character trait. Now, how do you practice being generous? Well, you start mm. doing it when it's not your automatic thing. So, for mm. instance, uh, you know, one way to practice generosity would be to make a habit of leaving the house with some pocket change that you can give to a homeless, the first homeless person you see. Mm. Most of us don't do that. But one mm. way to, to practice generosity is that. It's like, oh, but now initially you feel awkward. You feel like, wait a minute. Is this really what I want to do? Is this, you know, this is weird, right? But if you start doing it every day, I guarantee you, in, a, in no time, it would be second nature for you to put the pocket, you know, the change in the pocket, and then give it to the first person that, that you see. That's one way to, uh, to practice gener generosity. One of my favorite, actually, is practiced by a lot of people in, in the city of Naples in Italy. And what, what people do very often uh, is they go to a cafe, and, you know, they order an espresso, let's say, or a cappuccino, right? And then they pay double. They leave money for the next customer. So the, the barista yeah. knows that whoever comes next to get coffee or coffee. cappuccino is free because yeah. the, the other person it's has already nice. paid for it, right? That's mm -hmm. a nice way to be generous. You don't get your th thanks. This, you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. Part of the, the interesting aspect of that exercise is that you don't do it in order to be thanked by somebody because you don't know who's going to come back, who's going to come next. Uh, and you're probably not in the bar anymore anyway. So they're mm -hmm. not going to be able to thank you. You just know that you've helped, you've done a nice thing for somebody else, right? And it doesn't yeah. matter that that person could or could not afford the coffee. They probably could. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gone into the coffee house in the first place. So it's not a question of necessarily helping somebody who cannot afford it. It's a question of just doing something nice for mm. another person, particularly for a stranger, right? Mm. Uh, so I, I really think this is a great exercise. Just, just, the next time you go get a coffee, tell the person <laughs> behind the counter. It's like, hey, the next one, I'm paying for it. Whoever it's got this, who it is. You don't have to do it every time. You don't have to do mm. it every day. But if you do it on a more or less consistent basis, that... First of all, I think that makes you feel good. Uh, mm. you know, when, when we do things, when we do, when we do act of generosity, when we do good things for other people, we actually feel good. Virtue feels good. Uh, mm. this, this is an empirical fact. There's, there's no question about it. Uh, but again, more importantly, it actually helps because it becomes something that you just do on a regular basis, more or less automatic. And that, that's how you improve your character. Yeah, it reminds me of a quote that's, you know, every decision you make is a vote for who you want to be. Um, and doing those kind of good things is is slowly building you into a person, I suppose, that's the type of person that people like and admire and that's worthwhile. I wonder, because your background obviously is in evolution as well and in biology. And how much does yep. human nature come into this? And how much do we have is each individual's nature that we're grappling with um make it a bit more complicated. Uh, I wonder, did you do any, is, is there any yeah. personality theory or big five personality I, I find quite interesting um, in terms of this yeah, topic? Yeah, that's a good of, question. Uh, those traits. Mm. It's a great question. The, the Stoics would argue that it's very much about human nature. That is, mm. they think 
of course, they didn't know anything about evolution. But uh, modern yeah. evolutionary biology confirms, and modern primatologists confirms, that we are naturally pro-social, meaning that we are uh, we have a tendency to cooperate with other people and to treat other people well. Usually, you know, there are obviously there are exceptions, and we, it's not like we do it all the time. But by and large, we are pro-social, we are cooperative, and we try to do good things for other people. Why? Well, because we're social animals. And mm -hmm. our very survival and, and flourishing depends on good interactions with other people. And so nature, natural selection, has built into us these pro-social uh, you know instincts, so the Stoics had had understood that, even though they know they knew nothing about evolution. Seneca explicitly says nature is the one that has given us the beginnings of wisdom, and the beginnings mm. of virtue, right? Because we are naturally prone to interact positively with other people. Now, nature has also given us another thing: reason. Right? Mm -hmm. The major evolutionary weapon that human beings have is reason. We use reason to solve our problems. We don't use, we don't have big claws. We don't have wings. We don't, you know, we don't swim fast. You know, nothing, none of that stuff. We don't have big muscles, none of that stuff. But we do have big brains, and the big brains allow us to solve problems. Now, what kind of problems? Well, mostly, of course, survival problems, for sure, but mostly social problems. Our, in fact, many evolutionary biologists think that language and a, and a large brain evolved in order to be to solve social problems, to to solve the problem of how to deal with each other, how to live in harmony more or less, um, and in cooperation with each other. So Seneca, again, who didn't know anything about evolution, but was talking about nature, he said, mm -hmm. "So nature is giving us this instinct to cooperate, to be good to other people." And then reason expands this uh, basic instinct and because reason tells us that, well, you don't only want to be nice to people that are around you or the people that you grew up with or your friends or your family. You want to be nice to anybody because they're human beings, because, because they're just like you, because they have the same kind of wants and needs and fears and expectations, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can sympathize with other human beings just in the same way in which you empathize with uh, your friends and relatives, right? And that's where it comes from. So it is very much based in human nature. Of course, that doesn't mean there are no exceptions. There are sociopaths uh, in, in human societies. There are people who don't care about cooperation. There are people who are narcissists and so on and so forth. But the very fact that we use these derogatory terms, right, sociopath, narcissist, those are derogatory terms, right? And in fact, there are even terms that describe psychological syndromes, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a sociopath or a psychopath, this is, this is something that usually requires, uh, you know, the, the attention of a professional. It means that we as a society understand that those kind of behaviors, narcissism, sociopathy, et cetera, et cetera, are not healthy. They're not good behaviors. They're not the kind of things that we want people to engage in. And we try actually to do something about it. We even have medications for it. We have psychotherapy for it. Mm. Yeah, and that there's a normativity there as well of the type of character that we want versus the type of character that's destructive and deceptive and doesn't really you know play well with others um and I, I mean in terms of the human nature there's there's a cosmopolitan aspect of the stoicism which was coming out in the book as well which relates to the politics aspect which is that the stoics obviously had a very cosmopolitan attitude that everybody was you know we were all part of nature and there wasn't really specific divides um like that maybe other philosophies would have had but um i wonder does the human nature aspect connect to the cosmopolitan thing um is there a is that kind of a unique theory in Stoicism? Because it seems like a lot of people don't think that way nowadays. Um, it's quite fractionated. Right. You know? Cosmopolitanism doesn't, doesn't come natural. It, it has never come natural to human beings. Uh, we are actually, if anything, we're kind of tribal. We're, we're parochial. Mm -hmm. we're, we're focused on our own little tribe. And usually we're also xenophobic. That is, we don't like other tribes, right? We, we think that other yeah. people are potentially dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably a result of evolution because it's for the majority of human history, 
and prehistory, human beings have existed in small bands or, you know, like 60, 80, 100 individuals, most of whom were actually relatives. They were each other's uncles and, and nieces and, and nephews, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so to be distrust, to be tribal, meaning to be, uh, you know, loyal to your group and to be xenophobic, meaning to be distrustful of other groups, it's probably a natural thing for human, for human beings. That is why, however, Seneca says nature provides us the beginnings of virtue, and then it's reason that expands us, right? That expands yeah. those, those, the, those mm -hmm. natural propensities. So the natural propensity for cooperation tends to be limited to our in-group. It doesn't usually extend to the out-group. But mm -hmm. reason tells you that okay, but we're not in the savanna anymore. You know, we're not mm. we're not in we don't live in bands of a hundred people anymore. We live in metropolis like New York of eight million people. We live on a planet of eight mm. billion people that are highly interdependent on each other. What happens in Russia or or in China mm. influences what happens in the United States and vice versa. Mm. So there is reason that tells you, okay, even though I'm naturally xenophobic and tribal it's time to overcome that. It's time to go beyond that. And and some of the Greek or Romans understood that. Um, they, you know, the phrase, um, the word cosmopolitan was was uh, coined by the cynics, the cynic philosophers, which were about contemporary with Plato, essentially. And you know, cosmopo cosmopolis just means citizen of the world. It's mm. a it's a an acknowledgement that we should be concerned not just with our polis, with our city but with the entire, the city of the entire humanity. And now you mentioned politics. The book is mostly about the relationship between ethics and politics. Well, the word politics comes from polis, right? So to be mm. political means to, mm. to be concerned about your polis, to be concerned about society, <laughs> right? So today I find it funny that some people tell me, oh, I'm not political. It's like, what do you mean? You don't live in a society? <laughs> like you're, you're not concerned mm. about what's going on in, the, in your own society? Because how, how can you yeah. possibly be a political? What they mean is I'm not partisan. Right. Mm. So I don't necessarily subscribe to a particular ideology of a particular One or party, the other. which I think it's actually a good idea. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not the same thing. And probably not being partisan is a good idea. That's the way to make progress, because as soon as you start being partisan, uh, then all rational discourse goes out the window. It's a bit limited, all right. Yeah, kind of becomes like football teams or something rather than actually solving Correct. problems. Yeah, there was a there was an interesting experiment um, done by psychologists some years ago about tribalism. So they mm. they asked a bunch of people to uh, come to part of, be part of the experiment without telling them what the experiment was about. They got these people in a room, and then they just distributed. Uh, t-shirts of two colors, blue and, and red. And some people got red, some people got blue, right? Well, within minutes, the people wearing blue were only talking to the people wearing blue, and the people <laughs> wearing red were talking to the people wearing red, and then the red started saying <laughs> bad things about the blue, and the blue the bad things about the red. It's like, wait a minute, this is a random assortment. It's, there's nothing to, you know, there's no reason why you're blue or red other than somebody just randomly gave you a T-shirt, right? And yet that's how little it takes for human beings to become tribal. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, and it's a real problem as well. I mean, I live in Belfast, and obviously the tribal history yeah. of Belfast is quite ah, a right. checkered one um, and still ongoing and very hard to rise above. So, I th yeah, what I was going to say was that going to that higher level of like as a, a global society now that's interlinked economically but still kind of fractionated into nation states, I mean, is there this kind of idea of virtue taking us beyond the – the flaws of human nature beyond our kind of xenophobic or tribal aspects, our more emotional side that gets us in trouble. Um, do you think that virtue, this kind of virtue ethics, I suppose, is a, a universal thing that could potentially have that, um, the, you know, yeah, upgrading ability for human is. beings? Hmm. I think it is. And there, there's two sources of evidence, uh, I think, for the notion that that virtue uh, is a universal, it's a human universal uh, concept. One is you find it in all philosophies, right? So whether you're talking about Socrates or Confucius, they all, they, 
pretty much every philosophy seemed to have, every philosophical tradition seems to have a conception of virtue and, and the importance of character. And the other is that there is modern research in comparative uh, you know, psychology that shows that the concept of virtue is, in fact, universal. It's found in every single uh, liter literate society. Any society that is capable of writing has a concept of virtue, and probably also societies that are not that don't have writing, although the data there is a little bit more uh, you know, tentative. Not only that, but it looks like, although there, is a, there are cultural differences in the way mm -hmm. in which people understand virtue and, and how many virtues, for instance, people uh, can name and, and which ones are more important, those, there, are, there are cultural differences, as you would expect, uh, at that level. However, there is a core six virtues that appear to be near universal in human societies, and these are wisdom courage, justice, temperance, humanity, and transcendence. Now, the first four are the standard Greco-Roman virtues. You know, wisdom, uh, courage, justice, and temperance are the, the, the basic, the so-called cardinal virtues recognized by the Greco-Romans, which are found pretty much ev everywhere, everywhere else. The other two, transcendence and humanity, the Greco-Romans didn't list them as virtues, but they did have them. Transcendence means a sense of connection, of interconnection of things, uh, a sense that there is a there is a whole world that is bigger than you are, right? And the Greco-Romans, the Stoics in particular, very much had that notion of interconnection, uh, and and uh, uh, that's why they did a lot of uh, thinking and, and exercises, even uh, spiritual exercises about. You know, connecting, reconnecting with nature. They're reminding themselves that they were part of a whole, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's that's transcendence, and then humanity, meaning connection with other people, specifically, right? Cosmopolitanism is one way in which you uh, might articulate the concept of of humanity as as a virtue. So those six are pretty much everywhere, and mm -hmm. clearly they didn't become universal because just because of cultural contact. Uh, they they evolved independently. Culture. There's, these these are example uh, examples mm -hmm. of independent cultural evolution. So lots of lots of different mm -hmm. societies at different times in human history came up with pretty much the same set of ideas, and that tells you that there's some there's something to it. When 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 people yeah. across the world come up with similar ideas, regardless of uh, specific culture and time, then you know you can bet that there's something going on there that it's worth paying attention to. That's deeply uh, convergent. And you kind of think, I suppose, that it sounds uh, it sounds a bit wild on the face of it. But like, if you think about like what a, a really admirable person is, um, that that is kind of universal when we think right. about, you know, the ways people go wrong are pretty universal. So maybe the ways they go right as well are also um, exactly. quite, quite exactly. yeah. I mean, no, common. No, univer no, no culture uh, mm. thinks that being an asshole is a good thing. Uh, you yeah. know, no culture thinks that being greedy is a good thing. No, no culture thinks that uh, being self-centered and, and uh, narcissistic is a good thing. And so those are all vices. And then by, con by conversely, there are the sort of mirror images of these things. And those are the virtues, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And there was one thing that I wanted to pick up on because it's, it's, I suppose, directly relevant to the research that I'm doing, which is on the ethical issues of social media companies monetizing attention and um, the kind of attention yep. engagement business model um, and which we picked up, which is that nudging doesn't work to make people more virtuous, that nudging right. isn't, right, which right. I thought was very interesting because it was something I'd been thinking about in terms of social media, I think, has push people more into impulsive behavior, addictive behavior, foolishness, polarization. There's a lot of good research that's kind of coming out on that at the moment. Um, and if it can make people, you know, unvirtuous or vicious, could it make people virtuous by the same right? Um, but I guess, yeah, yeah it seems so like... So that's a good question. So. The answer is no. Mm -hmm. The answer is no. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, again, there is empirical evidence that that okay. is the case. The, Kristen Miller, in in his 
character gap book goes into the evidence quite a bit. I kind of summarize some of that in, in my book. So here's why not. Yeah, you can mm-hmm. certainly manipulate people's behaviors, right, by nothing. Yes, that's the whole and thing. And so yeah. you can make them things, as you say, that they are, you know, they're not good. And then you can also make them things that are, that are good. However, mm. because that's an external manipulation, not an internal conviction, it's not the result of an internal mm. conviction, then you're not making them virtuous. Virtue is about motivation. Yeah. Right? Mm. So virtuous action is not a right action necessarily. It's an action mm. that is done for the right reasons. Okay. Mm. So I can have a good intention, for instance, and you know, give money to somebody because she needs help, let's say. And then it turns out that um, she does something completely crazy with that money and, and, and not, not, not something that's actually useful. Well... So was my action virtuous or not? It was virtuous because my intentions were good. The consequences, the outcome of the action may or may not be good. That, depend, that doesn't depend just on me. It depends on the other person, depends on, on the other agent, right? So nudging does, bypasses the intentions of the agent. It's all mm-hmm. about the intentions of the manipulator, of the person who does the nudging. Right? Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and therefore, it's not about virtue because virtue is about your own intention, the intentions of the, of, the, uh, of the agent. So the Stoics would have definitely be against nudging because mm-hmm. they would say, you know, you're trying yeah. to fool people, you're trying to, to control people like the, if they were marionettes and make yeah. them do what you want. But that's not, that's not virtuous. That's, they're not doing it for the right reasons. They're doing it because they've been tricked. Yeah, and it doesn't improve their character or their wisdom in a sense because it's almost like no. if you could just program a person to do all the right things, are they really doing right. it? Like if you took them out of the context, they couldn't reorient themselves if things changed. Exactly. Or, um, exactly. It's not kind of a genuine. Exactly. You're, but then you're treating... Again, mm, sorry, yeah, just to ahead. play devil's advocate to that, I suppose, these types of conversations that sure. go up online, I think, and say role models that you can see through say youtube or something people are being exposed to influences like pretty much how i got into stoicism through donald robertson was through the internet and through this kind of you know that connection and then actually you know reading and talking and things like that but um so there does seem to be an element of it that can at least encourage give people different examples in the sense of the way examples in real life can help Sure, but but watching a video by Don, for instance, that that mm. explains about stoicism and, the, and that stuff, uh, that's that's actually actively making decisions. Like you are the one who mm. decides, hey, this stoicism thing sounds interesting. I want to learn more about it. Maybe I'm going to start practicing it. I want to learn how to practice it. So yep. the decision still comes from you. I mean, Don can give you advice and can give mm. you suggestions on how to do it. But you are the one that I said is making the decision, right? You're not being tricked by somebody into watching, yeah, in watching a video or or, or in acting Mm. in a a certain way. So it's very different. Now, as far as the internet is concerned, uh, I have, shall we say, mixed feelings. I I recently quit entirely social media. I left Twitter, Facebook, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Because I, yeah, because I decided that was a big decision. Because yeah. I decided that unbalanced, they're actually doing more harm than, than good. Now, yeah. they are doing some good. The example that you just pointed out, you know, yeah, I mm. can look up a video by a well-known stoic practitioner and I can learn. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of good stuff on the Internet, absolutely. But on balance, especially social media, uh, have, mm. I think, helped degenerate our social discourse even more than it was before. Yeah. Uh, another social scientist, Jonathan Haidt, has written an mm. article in The Atlantic a few months ago, which I think he's turning into a book uh, at this point, where he basically argues that social media are responsible for a lot of the bad stuff that has happened over the last decade. Yeah, most of the evidence. I'm, I'm in the process of doing the same, of um, closing the closed Twitter and TikTok and closing Facebook and getting off them because... Mm-hmm. Um, Again, I mean, the research I'm doing is directly kind of aimed at the fact that that is, it's distorting everything, particularly for my generation and for younger people that are now growing up, yeah. never knowing a world outside of that. Sometimes it's compared to the cave, I think, right. which is a good analogy. This kind of world of just contrived appearances um, that are changing our exactly. character and our values. Like, Correct. 
And I should and I should make um, a point uh, that that we need mm -hmm. to make a distinction here between social media and the internet because sometimes people confuse the two. It's like, oh, that, so you you're giving up the internet? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not. Obviously, I'm talking to you, and you're having a podcast, and the podcast gets published in uh, on the internet. So the clearly, internet. I'm not closing everything down, right? Mm -hmm. I have my newsletter on Substack. I'm not closing that one yeah. either, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So, but the difference here is in the social component. So, what makes Twitter and Facebook and all that largely negative, det det detrimental mm -hmm. platforms, is that they are. Uh, they they cater to the, com the lowest common denominator. They they encourage people to get angry. They encourage people to fire off these things. You know, there are a few lines uh, with no almost no contact, no fact checking, no nothing. Now, on the other hand, if you publish videos uh, or podcasts or, or write long long articles and stuff like that, now you, you're putting some thought into it. It's not like you know there's no immediate reaction. There is no uh, there's no rush of adrenaline. People actually have to take their time to read my essays or, or watch your podcast or, you know, listen to your podcast. So it's very mm -hmm. different. So it's not the, the criticism is not about the Internet in general. The Internet has a lot of good things about it. It's about social media in particular. And people often say I used to say, uh, oh, but social media uh, are a Technology and technologies are neutral, and you know it depends on how you use it. You can use it for good, you can use it for bad. Mm. That's true for some technologies, not for all of them. There is a book that came out recently that it's mm. exactly the, the title of it is "Technology is Not Neutral," and you know these yeah. these platforms are built in order to exploit people' uh, mm. uh, anger and 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 emotional reactions and stuff like that because that's how these companies make money. And, and we should be aware of it, and, and we should not facilitate that process. Yeah, and that, it'll be terrible for your character. I mean, I don't think there's anything worse than staring at TikTok yep. for eight hours a day for your well-being and yep. outlook That's on right. the world. So, um, That's right. Not recommended. Much better off reading a book or, or going for a walk. Yep. <laughs> yep. Or doing some spiritual exercises, which also I will put in the description. Right. But um. I think the book will be out, Massimo, by, is it coming out the 27th? Is that in the UK as well, or is it that just in Correct. America? Correct, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. In the United States, it comes out on the 27th of September. In uh, the UK, two days later, for some reason Fantastic. that I don't understand. But So okay. the 29th of September, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Well, it'll be out then um, by the time I put this out. So I'll put it in the description. I encourage everybody to read it. It's a brilliant book. And I think it almost felt like the start of a conversation that we need to have a lot more. Um, which is character and, you know, how we can put it in at the top of the pyramid, I suppose, is the thing we need to look after. Yeah. Sounds good. So thanks for your time, Masmo. Thanks. It was a pleasure.